Carter, good job. You get the five dollars. I told Carter if he hit his dad in the head with the jingle bells, I'd give him five dollars. He did, so. If you were here last week, you know we began a new series in our year-long study called The Story of God, looking at Genesis and Exodus, the first two books of the Bible. And last week, Pastor Brian began the, the series called The Promise. And if you might remember, if not, I'll refresh your memory, that Genesis sort of is divided into two sections. The first 11 chapters are the first section, and that's sort of like our origins history. How did we get here? Where did we, all this come from? What's our purpose? And then the next section, beginning in chapter 12 to the end of the book of Genesis, is really about God specifically calling individuals, and through that individual, a nation to be his people, and to that nation to bless the world. It begins with the promise of God to a man named Abram, who we know later as Abraham. I might refer to him as Abe, same guy throughout the morning in case you're confused. The whole thing begins by God calling this one man to trust his promise of faithfulness to him. That he'll make his name great. And that man in the ancient world, I'm going to give you descendants. And Abram didn't have descendants at that time. This is a big deal. This is bigger than your 401k. In the ancient world, you were a great person, a great name, a great man by the virtue of your descendants and your family. And God says to this childless man, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you a child. That's a promise. And through that child, I'm going to make a nation, Israel, to be my people. And through that nation, I'm going to bring the child of the promise, the Messiah, eventually, to bless all nations. That's, what we be, that's the story we begin, we began last week. Everything hinges, I want you to understand this, on God's promise. And to a lesser degree, on our ability to trust his promise. Sounds simple, right? Just trust God. Inevi inevitably, we have trust issues. When our kids were young, we had to be very care careful of using the word promise around them. Some of you moms and dads that have kids living at home know what I mean, right? If you say, we're going to stop for ice cream, my oldest son would often want to know, do you promise? You promise? You realize pretty quickly you'll be careful about using that word because to a five-year-old boy, if dad promises, if mommy promises, that's an ironclad guarantee this is going to happen. What happens if you don't stop for ice cream? Their little universe comes crumbling down, right? You broke your promise. So we would say things like, well, if there's time, well, we don't know everything that's going to happen, and so we'll try. You know, we can't control the circumstances. I remember one time my daughter saying to my son when we didn't stop for ice cream or whatever it was, it could be an earthquake, Noah, or a flood. You don't know. Mom and dad can't control it. So yes, barring an earthquake or a flood or a tornado, we'll stop for ice cream. Kids want guarantees. Kids want assurances. Do you promise? Is a way of saying, I want to know that my life's secure. I want to be able to trust something. And I don't think that goes away as we become adults, grown-ups. We still want assurances. We still want to know things are going to work out okay. But when you're an adult, who do you turn to? Where do you go for an assurance that your family's going to turn out all right? Do you look for do your economic health and wealth, the success of your children, your career stability? I mean, where do, you, where do we go to find out that there's a promise that we can cling to that everything's going to be okay in the grown-up world? When it comes to matters of our faith, we also have questions about this, don't we, and doubts. We need assurance. Which of you hasn't at one time or another questioned or doubted that God even existed, that he cared and was listening to your prayer, that he was good or involved in the world. Anybody? If your hand's not up, you're not listening or you're not being honest, right? I've had those doubts. As the pastor, I've had those questions. We all have. And I want to suggest to you that your questions about, about God's goodness and his existence and his concern and his involvement are not only natural part of being a human being, they're also a necessary part of learning to trust him. A necessary part of the life of faith. And we're going to examine how God handles one man's doubt and questions about him. Abraham. Abraham, the father of the faith. How many of you grew up in Sunday school singing the song, Father Abraham? Father Abraham. If you didn't know the song, that's probably a good thing. right? The, the hero of our faith. Three major world religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, claim him as a founding father. Father Abraham, the father of the faith. And yet we're going to see he wasn't such a rock after all. He had plenty of questions and doubts about God and about himself. The call of God in Genesis 12, we heard last week from Pastor Brian, totally redefines his life, totally shapes who he is. He leaves everything to follow God and trust his promise. But we're going to see in chapter 15 that it's not all so smooth for Abraham. If you have your Bible open in Genesis 15, 
But follow on the screen as I read the whole chapter. It's only 21 verses. We'll read the chapter and then try to make some sense of it. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven, and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and a great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. They will be servants there. They will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your, to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Rephim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites, and the Mosquito Bites. I just want to make sure you're still listening at the moment. I'm waiting for the time when nobody laughs. And I'm like, oh, you're not paying attention anymore. Can we admit that's a weird story? Can we all just admit that's a bizarre story? It's a strange story to us. Animals getting cut up, smoking fire pots. What is going on in this story? It may not be obvious to us yet, but I think the story has a tremendous amount to say to us about how God handles questioning, doubting people what he thinks about our doubts and our questions and how he treats us when we doubt. Now, God's already called Abram to leave. He's already made himself known to him. He's already proved himself faithful to him. And yet Abram still has these questions. The first thing I want to examine here in the text is the reality of doubt. I told you before, doubt's not only natural, it's also necessary in the Christian life. We see this throughout the Bible. In verse 1, we read the phrase, the word of the Lord came to Abram. That shows up twice in the first four verses, the word of the Lord. Now, later on in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when you read the prophets, we hear that phrase all the time. The word of the Lord comes to Isaiah. The word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord comes to the prophet. But this is the only time that phrase is used in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Here's the point. Abram gets from God something nobody else gets, a clear, direct, audible voice of God making a promise to him. Nobody else gets that, at least to this point in the story. Now, have, how many of you have at one time or another in your life thought something like this? If I could just know for sure God was in this, if he would write it in the sky, if he'd speak audibly, if he'd do something to convince me that this was really his will to take this job, to move, take, buy this house, to get in this relationship, whatever, you'd feel better if you just knew for sure it was God. Ever felt that way? Abram gets that. The clear, unmistakable, direct revelation from God, the word of the Lord came to Abram. So how would you expect him to respond? Clear, direct revelation from God. You'd expect him to say something like, oh, thank you, God. I was totally kind of losing my grip there, and now I feel so much better. That really helps out. Thank you, God. It's not what he says, is it? God says, I am your shield, and I am your great reward. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram says, essentially, Oh, uh, yeah, God, uh, since you brought up this thing about reward, um, since you mentioned it, yeah, um, what about that child you promised me? I mean, wasn't that supposed to be my reward, a son? And by the way, God, that was 10 years ago. I was 75 then. I'm 85 now, and I don't see that child. And my wife, I mean, I love her, but have you seen her? She's not exactly getting any younger, and we're kind of waiting here, God, for this reward you promised. 
It's been a decade since God said, I will give you a, a child and I'll make your name great. Ten years, and when God says, I'm going to be, your reward's going to be great, Abram doesn't say, thank you, thank you for the clear revelation. He says, where is it? I look around my life and you say it, but I don't see it. You ever feel that way in your life? God, I know you say this, but I don't see it. I don't see it in my life. I don't see it in the world. I don't experience it like I think you're promising it. Which of us hasn't had that experience at one time or another? And I, Abram's at least honest. Now, how would you expect God to respond? How would you expect God to respond? He gives a clear, direct, unique revelation to this man. Nobody else gets it. He gives it to him, and this man doubts him, questions him. You'd expect God to say, how dare you question me, right? You know, smash, zap. No. What does he do? This is, what I, this is one of my favorite parts of the story. Here's how God responds in verses 4 and 5. God says to Abram, Behold, the word of the Lord comes to him again. This man will not be your heir. In other words, the son of your servant, Eliezer of Damascus, that's not the child of the promise. You're going to have a son, a very own son. And then he says, he says he brought him outside, looked toward the heaven, number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, so shall your offspring be. I love this part of the story. God doesn't condemn him. He doesn't marginalize him. He doesn't say, you know, how dare you question me? God says, let's go for a walk. God says, come out of your tent. Let's go for a midnight walk and look up at the stars together. Now in our part of the world, we have pollution and suburban lights and the stars don't shine quite as bright as they do in some parts of the world. But some of you perhaps have been in parts of the world where there's, there's nothing to, to dim, diminish their light. Night is dark and the stars are brilliant. You've had that experience looking up and it's just overwhelming. You're awestruck. Imagine being in the ancient world of Mesopotamia, in the desert, and God says, let's go outside. Look up at the heavens. I did that. And if I can do that, you can trust me with your life. I'm going to do just as much for you if you'll just trust me. How many of you wouldn't like to go for a midnight walk with God, have him put his arm around you and say, look up at the heavens and say, I'm with you and speak to the very deepest doubt in your life. Wouldn't you like to have God say that to you? God does this for Abram. And look at how Abram responds. Verse 6. This is, by the way, the sort of the signature verse of the whole story. It shows up again and again in the New Testament. In verse 6, And he, Abram, believed the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed, and God counted him righteous. Righteous is a churchy word. We heard it read by Jim and Mary Hooper, the promise of righteousness. It just means right with God. In other words, Abram says, I believe your promise, and God says, on that belief, you're right with me. This is, the Apostle Paul will quote this in the book of Romans and in Colossians and in Galatians saying, this is the essence of the gospel. The faith that God gives us to trust his promise, on that basis, we're made right with him. That's the heart of the gospel. It is by grace you've been saved through faith. The trusting in the promises of God. And Abraham does that. This is the first reference to that. Genesis 15, 6. You think the story should be over, right? The midnight walk, the stargazing with God, okay, now I believe, and God says, good, go to sleep, wake you up in the morning, we'll get busy with this whole obeying me thing. The story's not over. Verses seven and eight. God says, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Verse eight. But he, Abram, said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Did you hear that? Verse six, I trust you. Verse eight, I don't trust you. Verse six, I believe. Verse eight, I'm not so sure. You know, he says, how am I to know, like a little kid, do you promise? Do you promise? But oh God, how can I know? Now, how would you expect God to respond? Now, what would you expect God to do? Now he's going to zap him, right? Enough is enough. I've told you two times already. It's not what he does. Abraham's belief and doubt go side by side. Here's what I want you to hear this morning. Doubt and belief, faith and questions, live side by side in the human heart. Frederick Buechner in his book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel is Fairy Tale, Tragedy, and Comedy, says the opposite of faith is not doubt. It's fear. The most commonly given command in the Bible is not doubt not, but fear not. In other words, even if I have questions and I have doubts and I don't have the answers, I don't have to be afraid because I trust the one who has the answers. I can trust him. I think 
we, don't, we struggle with this in the church sometimes. We struggle with questions and doubt. We feel like we're losing our faith, or maybe our kids, we're nervous if they express the big questions. I would suggest it's those questions and doubts that may be the very thing God wants to use to deepen your faith, to grow your trust in him. It's happening here for Abraham. It's the process by which you become an Abraham, by wrestling with it, by dealing with it. Think about this for a minute. This towering figure of our faith, Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one of the patriarchs of our faith. is like a little kid. How can I know? I'm not so sure. I believe, I don't believe. If that's how he does, how do you think you're going to do in the life of faith? Probably not much better. And that should encourage you that it's okay. I know some of you come here with your own questions, your own doubts, your own hang-ups. And I want you to know that God's all right with that. He's not condemning you for that. In fact, he wants to address you at that very point. But here's the important thing. God never condemns the doubter on one hand, and he never leaves the doubt unaddressed or undealt with on the other. There's a little chart here on the screen. It, it says liberal and conservative. I don't mean that in the political sense at all. I mean it more theologically, but it's probably not, those aren't the best labels. My point is, there's kind of two ways of dealing with doubt or skepticism, questions in the world. One is, on this hand, the doubt is a sign of intellectual sophistication, that the smart people are the questioners, always doubting everything. My father's father, my grandfather, my dad's side was sort of an amateur philosopher, among many other things, and he said to me one time when I was 12, I remember he said, Jeffrey, imagine a man who doubts everything in the world except the fact that he is doubting. <laughs> what? When I was 12, uh-huh, grandpa. <laughs> There's a, there's a sign of a certain kind of person that our world thinks is, is sophisticated because they question everything. They're doubters. And we revere them, or at least look up to them. On the other hand, there are those who would say, doubt is a sin, doubt is questioning God, doubt is wrong, you're losing your faith, and therefore we marginalize those people, particularly in some conservative churches. On this side, I think we breed cynicism. There's a big difference between honest questioning, seeking truth, and a skeptical cynic who just wants to keep everything at arm's length, Right? I don't want to really deal with it, but I want to question. It's a huge difference there. On this side, I think we breed hypocrisy. If I have real deep, big questions about God, but I'm not allowed to voice those, I'm not allowed to talk about those, there's no place for me to wrestle with those, then I have to pretend like I don't have them. That makes me a hypocrite. But the Bible's addressing, the way God handles doubt is like neither of these things. It's so unique. God never condemns the doubter, but he never leaves the doubt unaddressed. Think about the guy we call Doubting Thomas for a minute. Know that story, Doubting Thomas? He's the one who says, yeah, yeah, sure, he's raised from the dead. I won't believe any of that until I can see him and touch him and put my hand in the nail holes and in his side where the spear pierced him. And then Jesus shows up in the flesh. Now, if it is sinful and wrong to doubt God, why would Jesus say to him, Thomas, Touch me. Thomas, put your hand here. He doesn't condemn him. But then at the end of that encounter, what does he say to him? Stop doubting and believe. This is the beautiful thing about the, the, the gospel. It does not condemn you for having questions, but it doesn't leave your questions unaddressed. It's part of the growth process. Part of how we grow. I think it's happening here for Abram. This brings us to the anatomy of doubt. The story shows us kind of two sides of the doubt coin, if you will. On the one hand, we have doubts about God. In verses 2 and 3 of chapter 15, Abram expresses these. He says in verse 2, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and I have no offspring. Basically, he's saying, God, I have doubts about your ability to come through on your promise. You said this, and you're not doing it, and so I'm doubting you. And then we have on the other side of the coin, doubts about me, or you, doubts about ourselves. In verse 8, Abraham says, how can I know that I will possess it? In other words, it's one thing to say, God, I don't know if you're real, I don't know if you care, I have questions about who you are. It's another thing to say, okay, God, you may be who you say you are, but I'm not sure that I can live up to your standard. I'm not sure that I can be the kind of man or woman you call me to be. I have doubt, serious doubts about my ability to live this life. And I'm guessing you know something about both kinds of doubt. Well, it is the weird second half of the story 
that God is, in that story, God's addressing the two halves of Abraham's doubt. The strange, bizarre, cutting up of animals story. Timothy Keller in his book, Counterfeit God, says there's no greater picture of the gospel in all the Bible than the second half of Genesis 15. I thought, no, that's not true. There's lots of better pictures. That's a weird story. I think it's because I didn't really understand it fully. Perhaps you're in that boat as well. Let me read verses 9 and 10 again so we understand what we're talking about. He said to him, this is God saying to Abram, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, and a ram three years old. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. Okay, what? God says, bring me these animals. Abraham goes and gets the animals, and then he cuts them in half. And God didn't say to do that. So either Abram has some serious social issues going on, and he, can you imagine, like, if he wasn't supposed to, wouldn't you think God would say, what are you doing? Go get three more. Stop cutting them up, right? But God doesn't say that. God says, bring me the animals. Abram goes and gets them and cuts them up and arranges them in a particular fashion. Apparently, Abraham and God know something we don't know that's lost to us. There's something going on that they understand that we is sort of mysterious to us because of our distance from that ancient culture. Let me try to explain it to you. Abram knows when God says, go get these animals, he instantly knows what's going to happen. In fact, it says it one verse later, God made a covenant. Abraham knows, oh, God's going to make a covenant with me. The ancient form of a binding contract. We're going to enter into a contract. That's how he's going to address my doubts. Let me explain a little bit here. We live in a written, actually a digital culture, but the written word is still very important. We sign contracts. We write out contracts politically and in business and all kinds of ways. And we sign those contracts to hold both parties accountable to the deal. And if you're going to put an addition on your house, let's say, you're going to put a nice big three-season room on, the, on your house and you hire a contractor to come over and give you an, an estimate and a price and you agree verbally on a price and he does the work and it's great and then he comes to you and he says, by the way, it's going to cost four times what I said. But you never signed a contract. What's your recourse? You would say, I have serious doubts about you, O oh great contractor, to make good on the promise that you gave to me. How, what, what, I, there's no contract by which you can hold that person accountable. Now, in Abram's day, they don't live in a written culture. They live in an oral culture. Contracts are not written down. They're acted out. They're, they're symbolically enacted. So when Abram lines up the pieces, and uh, what he's saying is that we're going to pass through these pieces. We're going to walk between the pieces from one side to the other side. On this side, we don't have a covenant. When I pass through, we both do have a covenant. And what you're saying is, may it be to me, like these pieces of cut up animals, if I break my half of the bargain. And may it be to you, like these cut up animals, if you break your half of the bargain. That's how people would do this. Try that next time you have a contractor to do an addition on your home. Cut up some animals, lay them in your front yard and say, let's pass through the pieces. Oh great, and you get arrested, but anyway. But this is how it was done in the ancient world. This was not unusual. Abraham knows immediately what to do without being told. God's going to enter into a covenant, a contract with me. We're going to do this so that I'll know that he's faithful, and he'll know that I'm going to be faithful. In fact, this is, we referenced several times in the Old Testament. One in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 34, verse 18. God speaking through the prophet says this, and the man who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf they cut in two and pass between its parts. It's covenant language, common in the Old Testament, in the ancient world, ancient Near Eastern world. In fact, sometimes kings would use this very symbolic act to have you enter into their service. So let's say I'm the king and you want to enter into my service as one of my subjects, I would have you pass between the pieces. Now, I wouldn't, because I'm the king. I don't have to pay a penalty, but you would. In other words, may it be to you like these animals if you disobey me, your sovereign ruler, your king. That was also a common practice. So Abram knows what's going to happen based on the culture he lives in. But God does two totally shocking things in this particular covenant that would have blown Abraham away and are very important for us to understand. The first thing is this. Who passes between the pieces? Who's the first to pass between the pieces? Well, in the text it says a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch. So that's clear enough. Let's move on. Right? <laughs> what? A smoking fire pot and a blazing torch. Now, the scholars disagree a little bit about this, but most of them will tell you that the Hebrew words for smoking fire pot and blazing torch come from the same root words that are used to describe God in other places in the Old Testament. For example, at Mount Sinai, 
God descends on the mountain with Moses to give him the stone tablets, right? In smoke and in fire. Same two words, same two root words. Or later on, during the Exodus, when the children of God are wandering in the desert for 40 years, they're led by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. Cloud, smoke, and fire. Same two Hebrew root words. The point is, these are symbolic representations of the presence and power of God. God is passing through. This is why when Abraham goes to sleep, and the Bible says he has this deep and overwhelming sense of dread that comes over him. Why? Because God is coming near. The holiness of God is coming, approaching. He feels it. And then he sees the symbolic representation of the power and holiness and glory of God passing between the pieces. What kind of king is this that walks between the pieces? Kings didn't do this. Subjects did. What kind of king would do this? That would have shocked Abraham. The second shocking thing is this. Who does not pass between the pieces? I know normally in church you don't say things out loud, but how about we try it? Who does not pass between the pieces? Abe, right? The fire pot, the torch go through, and then after that, the contract's done. It's over. No more doubt. Abraham does not pass between the pieces. This is absolutely unique. This would never happen in the ancient world. Always the lesser person of lesser rank would pass between at least that much. What's the significance of this? What kind of covenant is this that only the king passes through? Only God passed. This is God's, remember Abraham's two parts of his doubt, right? I doubt that you're going to come through God. I doubt that I can come through God. What is God saying? He's saying, Abe, trust me. If I break my word, which I never do, this, I'll pay the penalty. And if you break my word, which you will do, I'll pay the penalty. Either way, I've got it covered. I will pay the penalty for either side. In other words, this does not depend on you at all, Abe. It all depends on me. You can trust me to be faithful to my word. You can trust me even if you are not faithful to my word. I will cover it either way. That's how much I love you that I will pass through and you don't have to. Every other world religion is some form of passing between the pieces, isn't it? If I pray enough, if I do enough, if, I, if I'm earnest enough, if I, if I meditate enough and give enough and serve enough, then somehow God will, you know, I'll hold up my end of the bargain, and he'll have to hold up his. The gospel is utterly unique. God says, you will fail. That's what we studied a couple weeks ago in the fall, right? The paradise lost. You will fail, but I know that, and I love you, so I pass between the pieces, so you don't have to. This brings us to the final point, the anchor for doubt. Now, Abraham could have had no idea what this would eventually cost god to hold up both ends of the bargain but in isaiah 53 we read this text all the time at an advent season verse 8 by oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living stricken for the transgression of my people speaking about the messiah the child of the promise. It's covenant language. Isaiah 53 is pointing us to the cross, and the cross is God's payment on the promise he made to Abraham. I'll pay. I'll pay either way. That's how much I love you. You can trust me to fulfill my word, to keep my promise, and you can trust me to cover you when you fail. That's the promise. That's the gospel. The cross is God's answer to that. And the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, he says, God uh, made Jesus by the Spirit to become our Redeemer, so the promise made to Abraham might also come to us. Did you, did you hear that? The promise made to Abraham in this ancient weird story comes to us through Christ. Why use the term anchor? Why do we use this phrase anchor for doubt? What does that mean? I'm not a very good sailor. I'm kind of a land lover. Years ago when we had a little cottage for vacation and we rented it for uh, for a little vacation our kids living at home in michigan we some of the boats came with the cottage and took the kids out to the middle of the the lake you know and i couldn't get the boat started and we're uh they were in little life jackets and i thought well well since we're out here dad will pretend like he knows what he's doing let's put down the anchor we can swim yeah let's swim so they jump off the boat and i'm left out the anchors so i put out some rope i put out some more rope put out some more rope and i thought that's good enough i tied it off 
and we jump down and start swimming. I don't know if you know this or not, but an anchor doesn't do any good if it just dangles in the water. So I learned this through my nautical training. It has to go all the way to the bottom and grab onto something. So next time you're out, you know, make sure you keep that in mind. So we're swimming around. I look up at the boat's on the other side of the lake, you know, because the anchor was just floating in the water. They were hanging there. Let me read to you the book of, from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 13 through 19. And I want you to hear this text read in light of what we just learned in Genesis 15, because it's, it's astounding. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, that's us, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope he set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul, a hope that has, enters into the inner place behind the curtain. And our hope is an anchor for the soul, but it only works as an anchor if it goes all the way down to the bottom, right? And grabs on to Christ. I think our questions and our doubts and our wrestling with who God is and what he wants and how to trust him are part of putting the anchor down a part of lowering it all the way to the bottom so it grabs on and holds fast. Because it's one thing to swim on a calm lake over to the boat that floated away. But what when the storms come? What happens when doubt and pain and difficulty and suffering comes? And the waves are pretty big. You need an anchor that's not just floating there. Let me ask you then, where's your anchor? Where is the anchor of your soul? Is it just dangling in the water? holding on to things that won't hold it fast? The hope of the gospel is that we serve a king who says, I hold up both ends of the bargain. I will never fail you. You will fail, but I'll cover it either way. That's your anchor. Remember our first question? How can we as adults, as grown-ups, how can we have any assurance in this life? Well, it's not in politics. It's not in the economy. It's not in the hope of our nation even necessarily. It's only in Christ Jesus. He's the anchor for your soul, firm and secure. He's the one thing you can hold on to and know it's rock solid. It's not going anywhere. It'll hold you secure. This crazy, weird, ancient story, I think, is given to encourage us today. We have this anchor as a hope, firm and secure. It's Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we pause to acknowledge that we are we're distracted people, we're worried people, we're forgetful people, and we often lower the anchor of our soul down in all the wrong ways. We're put, placing our hope in all the wrong things. Thank you for this, this story, which is part of your story and our story, which reminds us that there's only one place to place our hope. There's only one person that will hold fast. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who does not demand that we walk through the pieces. That we, because we fail. We're frail. But you hold up both ends of the bargain, Lord Jesus. You paid our penalty so that we might have a firm and secure hope. We thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen. Let us stand up. great line in that song. My hope will always be your promises to me. It's our hope and prayer that you would know that your only hope is his promise, his sure promise to you. If you'd like someone to pray with you at the close of the service, feel free to come forward. If members of the prayer team will meet with you. And I forgot to mention this earlier, but for those that came prepared to give, this being the first of the month, we'll receive the benevolent offering as you leave. Uh, and that money goes to serve the needs of people in our church, in our community who are really hurting. So thank you in advance if, if you came prepared to give. Now receive this morning's benediction. Brothers and sisters, go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and may he be for you the anchor for your soul, firm and secure. Amen, and go in peace.